so we're not over people. <laughs> Alright, good evening everybody, how's it going? Good. Welcome. Thanks for coming out. I was told before we get started, I need to give a very special thanks I need to do uh, to same old new Gemini and uh, Westacon Presents. And uh, I'd like to thank Andy Bierman and Timothy James for helping run the sound. I'd like to thank the camera crew that came out tonight. <laughs> you don't know us for Eli Howard and Greater Good. This is our last show of the year. And uh, we covered a lot of ground. We covered the United States and back two or three times this year. We went all over. We hit every southern state except for Florida. And we'll be there in like three weeks. <laughs> I started playing guitar when I was 12 years old. And in my early 30s, I decided I was going to walk away from my uh, only line of income and become a full-time musician. And thanks to people showing up, I've been able to do that for almost two years now. So thank you very much. And um, in that time, I've got to see a lot of neat things. I've got to see a lot of things that weirded me the hell out. And, uh, <laughs> as I said earlier, you know, being a guy that writes songs, I feel like we see the world through a different scope. And uh, whether that's good or bad, but I spent a lot of my younger years getting called different. And I've, I've, uh, I learned to come up through groups with it when I was, became an adult, but I've also seen some things out there that make me think all those people that spent all that time calling me weird. If they saw the stuff I'd seen, they'd say I was pretty normal. <laughs> and I've done some shows that made me walk away or drive out of there thinking I gave up my day job for this. <laughs> and uh, no show is more true than when we played the spring bike rally at a venue called Suck Bang Low in South Carolina. <laughs> and I got the all night driving shit, and as we were driving away, we had to be in Louisiana the next day, so we drove all night and into the morning. And I got the first driving shit, and as we were driving away, I started writing this song. It's called The World Is Crazy. <laughs> Like who the hell's all these people in the left lane? 
driving so goddamn slow. Now, I'm not trying to be rude.
It was night two of a six week run we were going on and it was a Wednesday night. And uh, I quickly realized that the crowd that was in there, which wasn't much, was all that was showing up that night. And I thought, man, I worked my ass off to do this and this is all the farther I can get. I felt like I was staring at a wall that I couldn't get around. So I did the only thing I could think to do, which was go out in the van and have myself a panic attack. <laughs> I started writing this song, and over the course of that tour, we went across the United States and back. We went all the way to North and South Carolina and back, and I wrote this song as I was driving across the United States. It took me about four or five weeks from that day to write that song. And so we just recorded it a few weeks ago. We went down to Austin, Texas. It's gonna be our next single that comes out. The song's called The Dream.
you are
So what do you guys want to hear? Crying. What's wrong, crying? John crying. Bad news. Bad news? I'll play that. I uh, will play some John crying.
The show's over at nine, so if you guys got any requests you want in, you best get to one. <laughs> Stay in on it. All right, that's what I like. I like you requested a song I wrote. The first person to say Tennessee whiskey uh, <laughs> gets penalized. You know what? These guys will. These guys will uh, confirm that I will play Freebird if the crowd's good enough. I've done it. <laughs> Who asked for staying on there, by the way? Who said that? Thank you. Yeah, maybe he's actually telling me to mind my own business. So, uh, uh, it was actually Nick's dad who asked for this. And, uh, I'd like to tell you guys a story that when I met Nick, he was freshly 21 years old. He was such a nice young man. A few months after I met him, I took him on tour. And uh, two weeks later, I managed to get all of his worldly possessions stolen from him all in one go. If there's ever anything I'd like to, uh, that I could not say enough about Nick, he never asked for anything of me. All he said was, when you can replace my stuff, I'd appreciate it. And I had to get all the gear to put on a rock and roll show. And unfortunately, one of the things that was stolen was Nick's acoustic guitar and it was the last thing to get replaced. And he never bitched, he never complained. He just said, thank you. And he gave me a hug and Nick has never Never quit on me. He's been with me since the beginning. And if there's anything I could just let everyone know is how much I care about this person. He's he's ten years younger than me, so when he and I have a pretty good relationship with his family. So when he's out with me, I feel like he's under my supervision. It's I just want you guys to know that it is very important that I bring your son back in one piece. And I I just want you guys to know how much that I love your son. So um, you've raised a very pleasant young man, and uh, he's been a good friend to me. And, I can't thank him enough for the time that he gives me. But speaking of that tour, what I was, the reason I said that is because I wrote this on that, on, it was during, on our way to show one of that tour. I told Nick, I was like, I'm gonna take you on the road for a month. Forgot to let him know that I was gonna get his bass guitar stolen. That wasn't part of All of his discs. <laughs>
don't believe I will. Now I'm not certain. As long as I'm between the lines, I went and ripped off.
I wrote that when I was supposed to be taking my girlfriend to the beach. <laughs> um, I'm friends with most of you guys on Facebook, so you're probably mostly aware that I uh, have a tendency to say a bunch of stupid stuff on there that's mostly regrettable. But hey, it's okay. And one day I said on my way home from work, I said, uh, in a perfect world, we still have petty and crime. By the time I got home, like 100 people agreed with me. And so uh, I was already over a month late on taking my girlfriend to the beach for her birthday, and I said, if you could give me 15 minutes, I can get this out. And I wrote that song, and uh, here I am playing it tonight for you guys in Candy Orton. Thanks for listening to it. <laughs>
Nick's make the world go round. Double up. <laughs> uh, double up. Uh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> Take a drink of water, if that's all right. No, no. To our health. <laughs> Being good. <laughs> oh, that guy. I see water. Yeah, really appreciate you guys uh, joining me in the house of the Lord tonight, by the way. Uh, anything put in the offering plate will be taken by me. <laughs> I see they even have white claws in here for communion. That's fantastic. <laughs> What's that? I think it's 30% now. Yeah. I'm going to write a big suitcase full of IOUs. They're just as good. Have you ever seen Dumb and Dumber? <laughs> so in a couple weeks, we get to take off for, uh, I think the farthest we're going is Port Charlotte, Florida. We're going to hit the road at the beginning of the year, get in that godforsaken van and go do this again. Almost like we're idiots. <laughs> Awesome. You know what? You know what I always tell people is there's people getting fired from jobs they didn't want in the first place. And one day when I was 12 years old, I got a guitar for Christmas, and now it's what I use to keep my lights on. Uh, that's to me is the American dream. So uh, there's days where I hate this job, but there's also days where I realize like I could be rolling under a semi truck, I could be answering the phones, I could be selling Kirby vacuums, I could be what my my dad could have been right, I could have amounted to nothing. <laughs> One of the coolest things about this next tour is that I get to spend January 6th. We're playing in Pueblo, Colorado, and my one of my favorite family members, Tobias, lives there, and he's a he's a recovering meth addict. And uh, when I first, for the first uh, 20 plus years that I knew him, I didn't like the guy. And I'll be honest, and I told him that, I said, man, you were right off to our whole family. And now the guy, all he does is he helps people get clean. And last year, right around the same time, we played in Pueblo, Colorado. And uh, the importance of this, where I was going, is January 7th, 2018, I quit drinking alcohol. And I haven't touched any since. And uh, last year, I showed up at his place. At like three in the morning, I think we showed up there. We're, we come from Wyoming and we got snowed in. I remember I opened up the door of the van, and Toby's a very imposing figure. He goes, Hey, cousin, I got this for you. And it was a coin from uh, AA. And he said, I run a meeting next week. Will you go with me? I got to go to my first meeting with my cousin Tobias. It was uh, one of the most eye opening experiences in my life. I realized that there's people out there that would love to have the problems that I have. I, uh, one of the gentlemen sitting there was still wearing his sweats he was straight out of prison. And, uh, when I'm having my worst days, I think of that day where uh, there's always someone out there doing worse than you. And I'm not as alone as I think I am. My cousin Tobias texted me today and I said, I get to spend my six years without a drop of alcohol running Pueblo with you. And he said, I love you and I'm proud of you.
so much alike.
end the set just the way we started. Okay, there we go. A little over. <laughs> so you wouldn't dare. I don't see Joel Steen anyway. They're not going to take us out of the house a little bit.
wants this one. I want this cheerful on my headstone. I spent the last few years trying to impress all these people out in Texas and stuff like that because that's where I thought music was cool. And I'll tell you right now, I'd rather be a bump on the road in Oregon than be a star in Texas. 